was a type of medieval armour that was popular for over a thousand years. What on earth is it? And why was it so popular? Well, I'm going to try it on and see what I think. What I'm talking about is mail, is this stuff. But it's a particular design of this stuff that I'm talking about. This is basically chain mail, which is a bit of a modern name. Mail, it was called a whole bunch of different things, probably just called armour for quite a long period of time. It is a chain mail t-shirt, basically. Uh, the design is not too long. The arms only covered to about the sort of mid bicep. This one's got some fancy brass work around there, which is probably not very protective, but would certainly add to your status on the battlefield. And this is typically known as a Bernie, although the origins of that word are unclear. Possibly it was first invented in Eastern Europe at around 350 BCE by the Celtic peoples. There is some argument that in fact, the Etruscans had mail as well, but we do know that around 400 to 350 BCE, we have existing examples of this kind of chainmail or mail shirt. It is just links of iron back in the day um, or steel later on uh, linked together in a four in one pattern. There are obviously many different ways of linking a series of circles like this interlocking circles together. A four in one was particularly popular throughout the medieval period in, in Western Europe. They didn't really go away from it. Uh, they did a little bit around the neck. There were some six in one patterns around the neck, which makes it much stiffer and much, much more solid. But basically for anything that needs to move, a four in one pattern for Western Europe, particularly England, was completely ubiquitous. Around the beginning of the 14th century, they changed the technique, which seems a bit weird to me, because up to that point, typically mail had been made by four rings of solid iron linked to one ring that was riveted. So you could mass produce the four in one pattern and then link them together with the riveted things doing it quite quickly, but it needed one in five rings to be riveted together. Around the middle of the 14th century, for some reason, that swaps. That swaps to a different type of rivet. So rather than a domed rivet, it swaps to a wedge rivet. And weirdly, they all become riveted together, which strikes me as a bit strange because that just basically quadruples the amount of riveting you've got to do for one shirt. But maybe it was to do with the level of tailoring that went in to the male shirt. Maybe it was just because it was all higher status now and therefore people wanted it fully riveted. Fully riveted shirts, way more than four in one patterns of riveting. But anyway, that's just one of those tiny little mysteries that I haven't been able to work it out. This t-shirt shape shifts and people in the Norman period, the arms get a bit longer and it starts to come lower on the uh, thighs uh, and goes even lower. So mid thigh and then it covers the knees and becomes a hobergion or a hobok. And these are words that would have been very familiar to people at the time, but they're kind of unfamiliar to me to say out loud. Um, and presumably they would have had many, many different regional variations as well, because this type of armor was incredibly widely spread and used by the Romans and all the way through the medieval period. So what the Romans were wearing as male or the Celts were wearing as male would be instantly recognizable, probably 800 years later, when it comes to people in the medieval period. Now, lots of people have talked about male not being very effective. And the simple answer is, well, no armor is perfect. Lots of people talk about male being defeated by heavy weapons and that kind of thing. Yes, it, it can be by particularly double-handed weapons and things like that. But broadly speaking, it protects you against the main threats that are going to actually kill you or take you out of the battle, which is stabbing and slashing weapons. It takes a hell of a strong hit to get through mail, 
you might break bones underneath it if with a mace and things like that. It's going to stop the ubiquitous spear from stabbing through your guts, for example. It's going to wind you, it's going to break bones underneath, but it isn't going to actually stab through the mail, particularly if you've got any kind of padding on underneath. But you often see this mail worn without padding. I'm going to show you that in a second as well. And, and, and it, it's one of my ideas about why this was so successful as a type of armor for so long. No armor will protect you from every threat. The best plate armor of the late 15th century still has gaps if you can find them, and it will be defeated by gunfire, basically. As guns develop, plate armor becomes less useful and gets broadly abandoned. Mail is similar to that in that there are things that can get through this, but if you want something flexible, relatively easy to wear, and that's what I'm going to test out, and that will mostly keep you alive for, I don't know, this is a guess, 70% of the threats you're going to encounter on the battlefield, then this is incredibly effective. And must have been incredibly effective because it was in use for so long. Nobody uses stuff generation after generation after generation if it isn't actually functional and useful in quite a big way. So this is, this is one of my arguments about the value of mail on the battlefield. It is used continuously for over a thousand years. It must have worked well enough to make people keep using it. Now, what I'm gonna do now is, is show you this going on as well, because this particular design um, is actually relatively straightforward to put on. So I'm gonna show you. So all you do I am in, I'm in my civilian outfit now, and uh, I have to arm up quickly. So all I do is find the underside, put my arms through like this. This is where long hair gets in the way as well. sort out the armor, put my belt back on, just take a little bit of the weight off my shoulders. And I am now protected by body armor. It comes down to, well, there, there are my elbows. So it covers half my upper arm, half my upper arm there. It covers areas, the chest, it covers down to well, a little bit of groin protection, a bit of back protection. Basically, it feels very comfortable. And this is something I want to test out. So I'm gonna go and do a whole bunch of different tasks while wearing this for a whole day and tell you what I think it feels like. But it is actually really quick to put on compared to my plate armor. It protects your torso, your body. Obviously you'd want a helmet. I don't have any throat protection, so there are lots of gaps, but it took me, what, 20 seconds to put on, if that? And I've got it on over my ordinary civilian kit. So I haven't had to change into specialist arming outfits. I haven't had to have servants help me put it on. This is the kind of armor that in the very earliest period would have been high status because of the metalwork that's gone into it and the skill that's gone into it. But as period of history goes on, it becomes lower and lower status as the rich posh people with servants and people that can help them put their armor on as they develop plates and add to it. This becomes something that an ordinary person can put on relatively easily, well, super easily actually, and can wear relatively easily as well. So there is no weight on your lower arms. And that, as anybody that knows, if you've got heavy gloves on, then actually the weight being far away from your shoulders means that things are more tiring. So heavy steel gauntlets, when I'm jousting or doing tournament, gauntlets, although they're thinner plates typically, and they are closer to the enemy and they're going to get hit, they're the things that really tire your arms out. Whereas the body armor typically doesn't really take too much energy out of you. I mean, it does, but it, it's closer to your center of gravity. So it doesn't require so much to move around. And if you want to attach a sword over the top, well, you just 
pop your sword belt on and you're basically ready to fight. So none of these things are, they don't require a whole bunch of servants to get you ready for battle. And they don't require a whole lot of storage or maintenance. This type of mail is relatively easy. You just keep it slightly oiled, keep it in a sack, get this right and tie this off. And you're ready for combat. You'd need a helmet, you'd probably want some gloves, you don't have any protection on your legs, and we know that the legs were targets in battle, but you might have a shield at various periods of history that would help protect that, or you'd be surrounded by a bunch of other people, and therefore they would be somewhat protecting parts of you. You just have to avoid stabs into the body. This is very difficult to actually stab through. Yes, the impact will be moved through, you'll be winded, you'll break limbs, perhaps, but basically this will stop you from having your guts pierced by somebody else's spear. That's what it's all about. It isn't gonna stop a great Dane axe from a, you know, if you don't see the Dane axe coming, it will chop through. We know that from illustrations. We know that swords potentially can cut through this kind of mail. Although modern tests say they can't, we have lots of illustrations of axes and swords going all the way through armor. So it might be that the armor was lower quality back then compared to the steel that's used for modern reproductions. We just don't know. But there are illustrations and stories of people being cloven down to the navel all the way through. But those are special big hits. Your average scrapping and people are stabbing, but not as well as they could. They're off balance, you're off balance. The, 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 the chaos of an ordinary battlefield being stabbed from the side without realizing it, having somebody, one of your friends hit you by mistake, that's going to be prevented from doing any meaningful harm to you by wearing this kind of stuff. One of the things that is often done in TV and film is the sword, and this is a sharp, um, the hero will often slice across somebody, somebody's armor. Well, sword, no sword is going to cut through the actual steel of mail. Quite frankly, any reasonable armor is not going to get sliced through. Um, quite frankly, even robust clothing is not going to be sliced through uh, unless you're very, very unlucky. It might be stabbed through. But basically, you can, you can, I can feel the impact there on my, on my guts and my chest. Um, so you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't not feel the impact. So in plate armor, I wouldn't feel that. I'd hear it, but I wouldn't feel it. But um, with mail, you definitely know you've been hit, but it's not going to cut. It's not going to go through. And similarly, when you're talking about you know, points, you're going to get impacts if you're very unlucky, but it's, it's going to oof you and it might do some internal damage, but it's not actually going to stab. Um, so <sighs> mail itself, even worn just over a tunic like this, is going to protect you from, and this is a, an estimate, 70 to 80% of the threats you will encounter on the battlefield. Yes, you can be killed if you're wearing mail like this and your legs are clear of any protection and so are your arms and your forearms. And as we know, forearms are often impacted in any kind of combat. You get defensive wounds on the forearms, but you're not gonna get stabbed through the body unless you're incredibly unlucky or completely unsighted and somebody's swinging a Dane ax at you. Um, so so it's, it's, it's good to remember that armor is about percentages. And if you're doing role-playing games or the equivalent, the armor will save you from, I don't know, 70 to 80% of the threats that you're likely to encounter on a daily basis on a battlefield. In later periods, it seems like they realized there were some <laughs> Uh, value in putting multiple layers of padding underneath this and so you would have 12 layers of linen that's got some other substance some other matrix holding it together a little bit like fiberglass but not quite so some kind of glue potentially that kind of thing with this as well and that creates an incredibly strong armor um, and it's basically a, a development of this you're just adding to the effectiveness of this kind of armor right that's enough about this kind of mail, this kind of ordinary working man's uh, armour. I'm going to go and do some working man things. I'm going to go and groom some of the horses, train them, ride them, maybe clean them out, do all the sort of things that I would do in an ordinary day. And we'll see what it feels like to use this and work in it. Because 
The soldiers that were wearing this kind of armour, particularly in the later medieval period, were likely not very high status. They're the sort of people that were going to have to sort themselves out, make their own food, work out where they were going to sleep, and basically do the hard work. They were not nobility with a whole group of people helping them out. So this is really the armour of, certainly in the later period, of the ordinary soldier. I'm going to wear this for a day and do my horse activities, try it out, just to see how tiring it is compared to my full plate harness. That's what I think. My thoughts are that this is super easy to wear and really easy to look after and is just practical. It is not the best armour in the world, but it is a hundred times better than not wearing anything at all. So far it's actually not been very difficult to do my ordinary everyday jobs with the, uh, with the uh, male Bernie on. Um, grooming Gossam has made no difference really, it's a bit like wearing a big heavy coat. So it does take a little bit more energy out of you but not really very much. My, my arms are quite free to move and um, horses haven't really bothered with it, not making any particular noise. It hardly makes a noise when you move, so again, there's no particular challenge to a horse. We'll see, we'll get on, do a few things, see how it goes. Come on then. Good girl. So good, he's not particularly bothered by the male. See what happens when we go a little faster. It is actually very easy to wear though because the weight is centered on your body um, and as anybody that's carried weights around knows that the further they are from the middle of your body the more heavy uh, it feels so this is actually I can understand why people like this kind of armor it's not super protective but like all armor it's kind of a compromise now this would protect your body not your hands or your arms or much of your arms certainly not your head, you'd need a helmet as well. But um, it's actually very easy to wear it. And I'm wearing it over a linen shirt and one layer of wool, just a wool tunic. And we see that in the Bayer tapestry. We don't see much in the way of what might be called sub armalis, which was the Roman expression for it. So under armor garment, good boy. You're doing very well, Carlos.
Good girl. Is it stand there? Good girl. Well, after spending quite some hours just wearing this, uh, it's pretty obvious to me, at least one of the reasons why it was very popular and why it lasted a thousand years, is because you don't really notice you're wearing it. Um, it isn't particularly cold. Um, it isn't particularly awkward or heavy. It's a little bit of, you know, you could argue there's a little bit of strain on the shoulders. Not, not any strain, you, you feel it, like wearing a really heavy coat. Um, but you could just get on with your day-to-day -day tasks. You could continue to wear your armour for a long, long period of time. And it doesn't really get in the way, like um, some kinds of armour does. It doesn't require much in the way of maintenance. You can put it on and take it off yourself. You can basically work in it. And that's why this type of armour with the short sleeves and it doesn't go too far down your body was incredibly popular for such a long period of time. And in fact, Milanese knights in the mid to late 15th century wore this underneath their plate armour. So it actually never went away, they just added bits to it. So this in itself goes from 400 BCE all the way through to probably 1450, 1480, 1500s. That is a long time for a piece of kit to be worn practically. It's almost 2000 years. Good girl. What did you think, sweetheart? What did you think? Yes, you didn't even notice, did you? Hey? Good girl, come on. Let's get you some hay. Good girl. And to take the mail off, very straightforward. Take the belt off. And then you, we see this on the Bayer tapestry. It's very awkward, but it's the easiest way I've found of doing it. Um, and forgive me, but this is what the most noble knights must have done in the time period, which is you sort of scrunch it up and then get your hair again, hair, is getting in the way and you <sighs> shake <sighs> you shake the armor off you and we see exactly that position on the Bayer tapestry for goodness sake so it's not very elegant it was probably done by nobility in the privacy of their tent um, uh, and it does help sometimes, especially if you've got longer pieces on your arms, it does help if somebody takes it off. But the easiest way is get it up as far as you can, lean over and just sort of shake the armor off. So I think that rather humiliating position is what hundreds of thousands of warriors would have had to adopt at the end when they take their mail shirt off and put it away at the end of the battle. Luckily they've survived it so they probably would not have been worried about how silly they looked taking the armour off. Mm -hmm.